Welcome this morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. I have both my wife and my mom sitting here, so it's wonderful to be, to be together to celebrate Mother's Day. It's a beautiful day outside again. Yesterday I got outside and mowed lawns and really enjoyed just being outside and enjoying the weather and the birds. And Well, actually, I couldn't hear the birds because of the sound of the mower, but I went to mow the back lawn and the high school had locked our our uh, chain without locking it to our padlock so I couldn't get in so that grass is now getting two and a half feet tall it's going to be a bear to mow uh, I may be putting out a call to you to help me mow that but anyway, it's just really good to have you here I was so blessed on Thursday I, I turned 60 I'm an old man now as uh, some of you had told me uh, turned 60 on Thursday and so many of you drove by our house at dinner time to wish me a happy birthday and I was overwhelmed with your kindness and even happy birthday on the trumpet by Dean Wagner thank you you bless my day we're here to celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ to remember him to settle our thoughts and our minds on him and also to celebrate our mothers today let's begin with prayer Father, just uh, thank you for today. I thank you for our mothers, Lord. I know that for some this is a painful day because we didn't have the mothers that we could have. And so I pray that for those who, for whom this is a difficult day, that you would comfort them by your Holy Spirit that you would remind them that you are our heavenly parent and you love us in ways that we can't even imagine. But Father, we also celebrate our mothers who have loved us, cared for us, supported us, given us the best of their wisdom for our wives in raising our children, Lord, and being such a good and strong influence in their lives. Father, once again, I just pray that you would fill all of us with, with an extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit today. We have not because we ask not. And so, Father, I just pray that you would fill us with a great measure of your Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the voice of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, that we might worship in spirit and truth, and the, that we might hear spiritual words that you might further open up to us the things by which we have been graced. And so, Father, we, with one voice, welcome the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, if you're just joining in, thanks for uh, joining us today. My wife is here, my mom, and my daughter, Nicole, are here. Sarah's coming over later to help ce celebrate Mother's Day. We're going to be doing the parking lot celebration again with a table a couple tables set up in the parking lot so we can continue to physically dis distance ourselves we uh, begin with a worship intro today and then two songs
morning again. Let's continue with prayer. Kind and merciful Father, I thank you that we get to live today. I thank you for the gift of breath, for the gift of beating hearts, for the gift of all those around us who love us and whom we love in return. Thank you for life, for the beauty of creation. Thank you for technology, for Facebook live streaming and YouTube and Zoom. Thank you for dear friends. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. But more than any, anything, Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life, living that perfect life on our behalf. Thank you for his death, in which your son took all of our sin in his own body and died. Thank you for the resurrection, for raising him from the dead, that we might be saved because we are in him. Thank you for his ascension, by which you accepted his blood as that atoning, covering sacrifice that forgives all of our sin, transgressions, and iniquity. And thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit, by whom Jesus lives in our hearts, lives in our lives. Father, I pray that what we believe would not just be mere theology to us, but that your spirit would be continually transforming our lives as we look away from ourselves and as we keep our eyes riveted on Jesus Christ, the one who set the course before us that we are running, the one who has already run it on our behalf, who designed the course, ran the course, finished the course, all on our behalf. And now you desire to, to live within us and to run the course of your making by living within us. Thank you that you know every obstacle ahead. Father, Jesus said that in this world you shall have trouble. But do not fear. For I have overcome the world. Thank you, Jesus, for overcoming the world. Father, I pray for everyone here that you would bless them by, again, a great filling of your spirit, that we might enjoy our day as we celebrate our mothers and our wives and as our children celebrate their mothers. I pray that each mother would be truly blessed today. And Father, in regards to the pandemic, I hear so much confusion, a cacophony of voices, some with dire warnings, some saying that it's not nearly as serious as people are making it out to be. Some saying that it will take a decade to recover economically. Some saying that this is the end of the world. Father, only you know what, what you are doing and what, why, are you, why you are allowing this. And so our simple, simple and straightforward prayer is, not as we will, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We have a number of announcements today. Coming up next Sunday, I actually stopped the falling petals because it was too hard to read and it made me dizzy. Um, next Sunday, our annual congregational business meeting will be held via Zoom 
on May 17th, next Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. And we're going to open the room at 12.30 p.m. So if you could plan on getting to the Zoom room early so you can get checked in, please don't wait till 1 o'clock. But if you could arrive early and if you've had a difficult time signing in, then please show up even earlier, right at 12.30, so we can help you. Jackie Wagner will be available and myself to call uh, if you need help uh, joining in. We encourage you, all of you to participate. It's a very important meeting. I'll be sending out the, the completed agenda on Friday, and along with the minutes, so you'll, you'll be getting those. And I just appreciate your uh, joining with us for that meeting. Those who aren't members are wel welcome to join with us as well. You'll find the link on our private, our Grace Covenant Church private group page. And we'll also be having Joe Nimala and Ann Nimala send it out via the prayer chain so that everybody has the um, means to get on to the meeting. We will have a, a waiting room, which requires uh, you to wait until uh, I, I admit you. And the reason for that is to keep uh, the meeting secure. So don't be surprised when you arrive and you can't seem to get in yet. I'll have to individually approve of everybody coming into the meeting. Also, in order to help you prepare for that, on Saturday, May 16th, beginning at 12 noon and then again at 5 p.m., we will have a practice session, which is just signing into those meetings. Please do not sign up for the trial meeting. It, it creates problems. Both of those meetings will be left open for an hour. So please try to sign in onto your Zoom via the link, which will be sent to you via email, or you'll find it on our GCC private page again for those meetings as well. And if you have problems, please call me. Um, I think you have my number. Or you can find it on Facebook there. So leadership team has decided to keep our building closed until Sunday, August 2nd, 2020, in accordance with Governor Inslee's four-phase reopen plan. Under his plan, we fall into that fourth category, whether it's 50, not more than 50 in attendance, which is sometimes we are over 50, but also that about 90% of our church are extremely vulnerable to this uh, COVID-19 virus. And so we want to keep people safe. We will monitor and reevaluate the situation as we go. So if we can open earlier, that's great but we will reevaluate before August 2nd, that Sunday, to see where we are and if we can open. Our primary goal as a leadership team is to keep our highly vulnerable congregation safe. If you have questions about that, you can call me. We'll resume our covenant group Bible study, The Discipleship of Grace on Thursday, May 21st, beginning at 7 p.m. via Zoom. A link to the Bible study will be emailed to you or a link will be placed on our GCC private page. So if you're interested and you aren't on the GCC private page, you can email me or, or message me on Facebook and, and request being on that page. And we will be continuing our third unit, Descent of Man, looking at the finishing the story of the 12 brothers. And lastly, I very much appreciate all of you who have been sending contributions in. We're doing pretty well. Uh, contributions may be sent to the church at 1211 Venita Avenue, Bremerton, Washington, 98337. It's a very secure locked mailbox. And so uh, I appreciate if you could continue to give as the Holy Spirit leads and, and as you are able. If you have any questions about any of these, you can call me at 360-373-4332. You can always look that number up on our um, website. Let's begin with prayer before my message. Father, you know I'm tired today. I need your help, Lord. I need your grace and truth and the power of your Holy Spirit to overwhelm me. So once again, I pray that you would fill me with a huge measure of your Holy Spirit, that you would order my thoughts, that you would help me to speak clearly, that you would guide me, that you would bring me to say everything I need to and keep me from saying the things I don't, that you would help me to enunciate clearly, 
that you would keep me on track, Lord, and that you would open my mind and my heart to understand this text and to be able to communicate it clearly, the truth of your word. And I pray for everyone watching and listening that you would give us open hearts and open lives to receive the word that you have for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today our text is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16-20. through 20. We continue our study in 2 Corinthians. Next Sunday will likely be our last Sunday in 2 Corinthians. I think after that we're going to be going back to the Gospel of John. And then on Communion Sundays we'll be going back to our study of Exodus or Isaiah 52 and 53, the Song of the Suffering Servant. So let's read. Genesis, or 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us we beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So today we begin verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Again, we have that therefore, which is a conclusion word, a transition word that says in light of what we've just seen, now we're going to present this information. So we look back to the verses right before this, the text we, we looked at last week, at least part of it, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. What's he getting at? If you look exactly at that one died for all, therefore all died. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. If you think about it, it's easy to judge people in the world. It's easy to have a kind of a critical outlook on life. Christians are really good at this. We can get self-righteous, forgetting that all of our righteousness comes from God. None of it is produced of our own flesh. And so, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. And the reason why is because Jesus died for everyone. Jesus died for all, and therefore all died. Does that mean everybody is automatically saved? No. It's clear from Scripture that salvation, the gift of eternal life, peace, and so on are a gift. And so a gift has to be received. First of all, in order to receive a gift, you have to believe that the giver is giving it to you. And secondly, you have to actually receive the gift. However, when you think about it, if Christ has died for the entire world, then it changes how we are to look at people. When I was in my chaplaincy training at St. Francis Hospital in Evanston, it had been a level three trauma center, and I did not want to be a chaplain in a level one trauma center. So I prayed, Lord, lead me to a, a hospital that's a level three trauma center, so I won't see that horrific violence and the heartache of 
people being brought in by helicopter and ambulances and so on. A week before I began, the hospital was upgraded to a level one trauma center. Anyway, my supervisor was a, a man named Art Molka. It was a Catholic hospital and he was a born again Catholic, a, a born a new Catholic who had entrusted his life to Christ, who had believed in the name of Jesus for his salvation. And I would see him crossing himself. And so one time when I was just with him alone, I asked him, so what's that about? I see you doing that. I'm Protestant. We don't have that tradition. I'm just curious why you do it. And Art said, well, it's essentially just tradition, but I have found something very, very helpful in doing it. And that is, as I make the sign of the cross, I draw a cross between you and me. And so I look at you through the cross. And I'm very thankful for Art. He, he gave me a good way of seeing people. Now, I don't go around drawing a cross between you and, you and me or between those odious people who I run into who are hard to love. But it's good to remember that we see every, everyone through the eyes of the cross. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. We don't look at them in the fallenness of their flesh. Flesh for Paul always has to do with that corruption that we fall into. But we look at them as people for whom Christ died. Now start applying this to people you know. Let's begin with President Trump and Vice President Pence or former President Obama and his wife Michelle and his Vice President Joe Biden. Starting to step on toes here. How about Nancy Pelosi? Do you need to draw a cross between you and Nancy Pelosi? Or Mitch McConnell? Do you need to draw a cross between you and Mitch McConnell? I think so oftentimes, even as Christians, or maybe especially as Christians, we tend to malign people. And we're commanded in Titus 3 that we're not to malign people. We are to pray for them. We are to live at peace with them. And the idea is because Christ died for all, therefore all have died. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. That word recognize there, there's a word play in this, in this verse that you don't catch in the English. It would have been fun if they actually had put it in, but I, I think this version did a pretty good job. So the word we recognize is the word to know, one of the words for to know something in the original language of the New Testament. It means to be intimately acquainted with or stand in close relationship to. So therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. We are to look at people through a close relationship. You go, man, that's hard to do, Grant. Yes, it is, but who do we have living inside of us? Who loves these people? And so have we known President Trump? Have we drawn ourselves into a close relationship with him, even though from afar, in our prayers, in our concern for him and Melania and their family, their extended family, or that same concern and that close relation with President Obama and Michelle and their family. I point out these two people because we so frequently fall, in, fall into disdaining and maligning one side or the other. But there's a whole lots of other people, our bosses, our co-workers, that co-worker that gets under your skin, that boss who seems unreasonable, Therefore, from now on, we recognize we know intimately no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, and now we get to the second word play here. It's another word for we, we have known or we know. It's to know, except for the first one was oida. This one is gnosko. And this one is a different kind of knowledge. The first word is the kind of knowledge you have when Adam knew Eve and she conceived. 
It's that intimate knowledge that's extremely intimate. But here, this word means to arrive at a knowledge of someone or something to know, know about, make acquaintance of, to arrive at a knowledge. And so Paul says, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, there's all kinds of debate about what this verse means, about what this phrase and clause means. The even though can be if though we have known Christ according to the flesh. So some people interpret this as Paul had never seen Christ and the Corinthians had never seen Christ. So this is contrary to fact. It's not true. If though, if though we, had, we have known Christ according to the flesh, but it's not true. If we had known Christ according to the flesh. But when you look at the, the third clause of this, I don't think that bears out. I think that even though we have known Christ according to the flesh has a different meaning. Paul may have seen Jesus. We don't know. It's unlikely because I, I would think that if he had seen G Jesus, he would have said so. But he was a Pharisee. He was studying under Gamaliel, we believe. He was close to the Sanhedrin because he was being sent out by the Sanhedrin. And so, from that context, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, if you think about, there's two contexts here. In 2 Corinthians, we, we've talked about the difference between living under the law and living under grace and truth. And so all Paul knew was this life under Judaism, life under the law. For Paul, looking to Christ as the Messiah would not be, have been Jesus. It would have been an entirely different sense of what the Messiah was coming to do. Certainly, it would have been the Messiah was coming to live out and fulfill the law. But beyond that, they had this anticipation that when the Messiah would come, he would overthrow the Roman government. He would restore Israel to that place of prominence. And so, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, also as being a Messiah, uh, under the Messiah, they would have how do I say it? They would have, Paul would have known him according to that Christ who lived under the law. And this is debated. I, this one is attacked by some scholars because it seems to pit Paul against Jesus. But I think we've seen that clear distinction in 2 Corinthians between the law and between the new covenant of grace, the new covenant of the transforming power of the Spirit. And so, how do I get at this? Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh would be that Jesus who's living under the law, speaking to people under the law, and he seems to be on track with overthrowing the Roman Empire. That's what was people's expectation. But now Paul has come to know him as the resurrected Christ, as the exalted Christ. And so no longer is it the Christ who says, live under the law, which he repeatedly says in the Gospels. But now, because of the shed blood, blood of Jesus and the sacrifice, now we have Paul giving the message of the Gospel of grace the gospel of the shed blood of Jesus, the resurrection, the ascension, the giving of the Spirit, the transforming power of the Spirit. So even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, whether that was looking ahead to a Messiah that was to overthrow the Roman government, or if it was the understanding of, of what Christ said to those living under the law, that they should live under the law perfectly, Paul loved nuances, and so, I think maybe both are true. And then we move on to this third one. And it says, yet now we know him in this way no longer. So whether it was Paul looking as a Pharisee, looking forward to the coming of a Messiah that would overthrow the Roman government, or if it was according to Paul, who's saying we no longer look at Jesus as, as how do I say it? As the one who demands people to be living under the law. 
Now, how do we know? How do we know if this is a correct reading? I want to, well, there we have that word again, to arrive at a knowledge of someone or something, know about, make an acquaintance of. And so we know him, we come to know Jesus in that way no longer. Whether it's the conqueror of the Roman Empire or whether it's the Jesus who demanded that we live perfectly under the law. I like to put things in context. So in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 21, we read the story of, of Saul, who becomes Paul. And I think this gives us a backdrop for understanding these verses. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. These verses follow right upon the stoning of Stephen, where Saul was standing holding the coats, approving of the stoning of Stephen because he was a Christian, because he was a follower of Jesus, because he, had, he was of the way of Jesus, belonging to the way. And so now Paul, Saul seems, seemingly has run out of people in Jerusalem. So now he's been sent to Damascus, to the synagogues of Damascus, by the high priest. So he had a close relationship with Caiaphas, the high priest. And he's being sent to arrest people in, Dama in Damascus, Christians, Jewish Christians, who have turned to this cult as far as he was concerned and then bring them back bound to Jerusalem for trial and possibly for even death and by stoning. So here we have this man who has set himself 180 degrees against Christ. What a shock he's about to have. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light fell from heaven, a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Shocker of shock shockers, here he is going to Damascus to kill Christians, to bring them back to, to trial, essentially to have them put to death. And he has this divine appointment, this divine intervention in his life. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's an extremely blind light, or uh, bright light. Paul responds, or Saul responds, Who are you, Lord? i got to know this information. It's important. And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus who you are persecuting. So up to this, this point, how did Paul know Jesus according to the flesh? as this would-be Messiah, this pretender, this false Messiah, this false Christ. Christ is Greek for Messiah. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Here he's on his way to Damascus to bring back those bound to face trial and possi possi the possibility of execution. And now he finds that the very one he's setting out to destroy, his name, the name of Jesus, is the very God he has been purporting to worship all these years. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood spe speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing and leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and either ate nor drank. Think about this. Three days without sight. He's blind. He's probably wondering if he's ever going to get his sight back. What Jesus is going to do to him now, because he's been persecuting Christians, I'm sure the memory of, of Stephen and his death and the blood that is on Paul's hands is fresh on Paul's mind. 
Three days to think about his life. Three days to think about what he's been doing. And essentially, he's going into a fast. He neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, inquire, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision an am, a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he may regain sight. Ananias knows full well who Saul is. He knows full well that Saul has been sent to Damascus at, by this time to destroy to destroy Christians. I'm sure news travels fast. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to the saints at Jerusalem. It's likely that he had heard about the stoning of Stephen. Are you crazy, Lord? You want me to go and see Paul or Saul? You want me to go and meet with him? You got to be out of your mind. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to blind all who call on your name. So I go to him. I'm going to be bound and taken back to Jerusalem. But the Lord said to him, now listen to these words. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Oftentimes we call Paul the, the apostle of the Gentiles. But when you actually look at this, these are Jesus' words. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings before Caesar, Herod, uh, King Agrippa, and so on, and the sons of Israel. Do you get what Jesus is saying here? He's saying that Paul is the one who's going to bring his message. He is my chosen instrument to bear my name, to bear my gospel, if you will, to the Gentiles and kings and to the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer. And we've read all about this, that how much Paul suffered in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. Wow, Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom appeared to you on the road by by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Think about what this means to, to Paul. He was going down this road towards Damascus to destroy Christians. Now in Damascus, he's going to return to Jerusalem, proclaiming the name that he was trying to stamp out. Continuing, and immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. What a shock to those in the synagogue in Damascus. They were expecting him to come and make severe trouble for them. And now here this man is proclaiming the gospel, All those hearing him continued to be amazed, shocked, and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name? So we know that it wasn't just at the, at the stoning of Stephen that he was present, but he was at present at the death of many Christians who had been killed in Jerusalem and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. Shock. What has happened? We know that Saul's name is changed to Paul. And so back over to 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Paul had that, um, how do I say it? He knows now that Jesus has died for the whole world. And that as he goes into all the world proclaiming the gospel, he sees people no longer as just mere human beings, fallen and sinful, but as those for whom Christ died, having died for all. Even though we have known Christ according to flesh, 
Paul had had, had that in anticipation of what the Messiah would look like when he came, that he would be the conqueror of the Roman Empire, that he would be the overthrower of the empire, that he would reestablish the kingdom of David and the kingdom of Solomon to its glory. Even though we have known Christ according to flesh, he knew of Christ under the law that Jesus urged people to live under the law. But he thought that Christ was a false Christ, that Jesus was a false Christ. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. He had a Damascus Road event in his life, an intervention. And he had become the chosen instrument of God to bring God's message of the grace of Jesus, the gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, to kings, to Gentiles, and to the Israelites. How do we know Jesus? I grew up in a Christian boarding school that gave us legalism, that gave us, you better keep the Ten Commandments, and you better keep all the rules that we have made to make sure you keep them. And if you don't keep them, you better gouge out your eyes, you better cut off your feet, you better cut off your hands. We had one evangelist who spoke that literally to us. I never came to know the, the exalted Christ, the risen Christ, who having completely fulfilled the law's demands in his own body, it is finished, now proclaims the gospel of grace, the gospel of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who lives within us who strengthens us, who transforms our life from one degree of glory to another. I've come to know Jesus in a wholly different way than when I was a child. I've come to know his tenderness, his love for us, his gentle teaching, and his extravagant grace, the power of his grace that can transform despicable lives such as mine. Now I know the God and the Lord Jesus who loves me just as I am, but who doesn't leave me where I am, who doesn't leave you where you are, but lifts you ever higher. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Might this change how you look at people? And then moving on, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things can, have come. Again, we have the therefore. And so we look back again. And I think there are two therefores. You see the therefore in, chapter, in verse 16. And then you see the therefore in, in 17. And I think these are both going to what falls ahead, before that in verses 15. 14 and 15. So therefore, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you have received that gift and you are in Christ, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul is getting at the Corinthians have made that commitment. They have come to believe, not even a commitment, they have come to believe who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he is God in the flesh. And so he's reminding them that they are indeed in Christ, and therefore they are brand new creations. Moving on, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creature. I think of this reality that when you become a Christian, that old Grant, that old you has died. You become a brand new creation, a brand new creature. It's literally creation here, but the NASB has 
gone with creature because it's more point, pointed to what we've become. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. That old Grant, that old you, has been crucified in Jesus when he died on the cross. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In a life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So under the law, you had to do the living according to your effort, according to your strength. In the new covenant, it is no longer you and I who live because we live as dead people, but Christ who lives in us. And how do we do that living of Christ living in us as dead people? And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, by trust, by believing the Son of God who loved me, who loved you and gave himself up for you. I've said this many times, but when you're living in the flesh and that in this frequent corruption of the flesh, we tend to look to ourselves to make promises that we'll never do that again. Galatians 2.20 says, don't do that. Look away from yourself. You cannot reform yourself. Dead people don't reform themselves. They're dead. But look away to the Son of God and remember two things. In those moments when you have failed, in those moments when you are reminded of who you've been in your past, look to Jesus and remember two things, that he has loved you and, given, and has given himself up for you. If, any was, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I think of the story of Nicodemus in John 3, 1 through 8, about this new creation, about this new creature. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus recognizes some truth about Jesus, that the only way Jesus could be doing all these incredible miracles of raising people from the dead, healing people, setting them free of demonic bondage, is because he's sent from God. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew or born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, being a teacher, should have known these things, but he takes Jesus literally and says, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? So he's taking it literally. How can I climb back into my mother's womb? It's impossible. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't, cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Being born of water, some people think that's water is a symbol of the word, and so it's the gospel. I think in this context of flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit. It's talking about being born of water. It's talking about the moment when our mother's water broke and then we were born. That which is born of water and the spirit. So you have to be both have a physical birth and then a spiritual rebirth. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, the old things, the old self, the flesh. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. If anyone one is in Christ, he is a new cre creature. Or other versions have it, he is a brand new creation. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. When you encounter people born of the Spirit, you can't see what motivates them. You don't understand why they love people in the way they do, why they grace people in the way they do, if indeed they are walking in the Spirit and being led of the Spirit. So therefore, if any was in, anyone is in Christ, she is a new creation, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ then that person has been born of the Spirit and has become an entirely new entity, if you will, a new creature, a new creation. And then we move on and it says, the old things passed away, behold, new things have come. 
Read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 18. We've seen these before, but in the context, this is what Paul is talking about, those old things that have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Certainly it's that old life of mine, that old grant, that old life of yours has passed away. This new being, this new creation has come. We are living as brand new cre cre creations. He's asking the second Corin those, the Corinthians, he's asking them because they have been told that they have to come back under the law again, at least some part of it, to live an adequate and acceptable life. And Paul is getting at, no, that, that life has passed away. You don't have to live under the law. New things have come. So let me return and read these verses quickly in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 18. Such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, for our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as, as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The old things have passed away, or are passing away. Here it's the old things have passed away, and according to the context, what is it? The things of the letter. And it goes on, but if the ministry of death in, in letters engraved on stones, which is the Ten Commandments, so the old things passing away would include the Ten Commandments, all 613 commands of the law. Does that mean we are left without a moral standard? No, we have a higher moral standard established in the New Testament than we do in the Hebrew Scriptures. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? So now this contrast between the ministry under the law, under the Ten Commandments specifically, and under life in the Spirit. The law brings death, as, as we have seen at Mount Sinai when 3,000 people died. The Spirit gives life, as we see on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit falls. Peter preaches one sermon and, sermon and 3,000 people come to life. Do you see what Paul is getting at? The old things have passed away. The old covenant under the law, the covenant of circumcision made by Abraham and fulfilled in, in the dictates and the commandments given through Moses. That has passed away, and a new covenant has taken its place. New things have come. A brand new covenant. A brand new locus of power in the Holy Spirit. He goes on, he says, For if the ministry of condemna condemnation has glory, he admits that it came with glory. Remember Moses' face shining? Much more does the ministry of right righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory, in this case, has no glory, because of the glory that far surpasses it. So what Paul had been saying to the Corinthians, you're going back under the law to a faded glory, a, a, a glory that's even now, and the word is being abolished that word, not the same as in Matthew, but it's, it's fading away. Why go back to that when you can be in the new covenant full of glory? The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains, and so the ministry of the Spirit will, re will remain throughout all eternity. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech, and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. We use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face because he didn't want the Israelites to see that glory fading away. Anytime he went into the presence of God, into the, into the presence of Yahweh, he would come out glowing with glory. And then concluding, but their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is removed in Christ. So get this. These Corinthians, who had put themselves in back under some measure of the law, now had a veil over their eyes. They were going back under the things that have already passed away. And Paul is going, nonsensical. Why are you doing that? But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart, meaning their mind. 
But whenever a person turns to the Lord, turns to Jesus, the veil is taken away. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is born of the Spirit. He is a brand new being, brought into a brand new covenant. The old things have passed away. That old confining re regulations of the law have now passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now the giver of the law, the author, the writer of the law, the Spirit, has come to live within us. And it goes on, it concludes with these thoughts. And this is, new things have come. Now the Lord is a Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, who is a Spirit. And so we, as we turn to the Lord, that veil which the law puts over our eyes is lifted. And we see that the transforming power does not come from ourselves, but we are transformed into the image of Christ, into his likeness, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is a spirit. New things have come. The transforming power of the spirit has arrived. Under the law, you had to do it yourself. Under the new covenant, it's all about the spirit submitting ourselves, surrendering ourselves to the Spirit. Continuing in 2 Corinthians 5.18, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That word reconcile, in our literature only, it has only this meaning, the exchange of hostility for a friendly re relationship, to reconcile someone to someone, and so it would be God reconciling us to himself. It's not that he is reconciled to us. He is reconciling us to him through Christ, through his death on the cross. We were enemies in our minds because of the sin in our life. If we had approached this holy God, we would have died just because of his presence. Now all these things, what things? All the things that he's been talking about in chapters 1 through 5 of 2 Corinthians. This is kind of the summation of his argument. Now all these things are from God, the ministry of the Spirit, the death in our living, that living death in our bodies so that Christ may be manifest in us, the eternal hope that we have and the coming glory that far outweighs everything. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through, through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. How did he reconcile us? I think we're going to skip this text. You can read it later on, Romans 5, verses 1 through 10. And we're going to go right on to, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Those of, of, of us who have entrusted our life to Christ, you and I have been given the ministry of, of reconciliation. What does that mean? It means to bring to others that gospel of grace. That gospel that says Christ died for all and therefore all have died. He has forgiven all of our sins at, at the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting, have eternal life. And so he's entrusted with us, you and I as Christians, he has entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. It goes on and it says, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against this, against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So when Jesus lived, he lived as a perfect human being, indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit, indwelt by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So God, in the mystery of the Trinity, in the person of the Holy Spirit, was indwelling Jesus. And through that, God was reconciling the world to himself out of love for the world, out of love for every human being for whom he died. Not counting their trespasses. A trespass is going beyond the boundaries of the law. A trespass was breaking those boundaries of the law. 
Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou, thou shalt not bear false witness. How did he do it? Not counting the trespasses against him? Next week we'll see, he made him who knew no sin, this is 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So many pronouns there, I, I filled in who the pronouns are, pronouns are referring to. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. I've lost both my parents to cancer. I hate cancer. I have cancer. Cancer is when one cell decides to replicate itself and make the whole body after itself. Such a stark picture of what sin is. We become our own gods. We are going to have it our way. Not only in my own life, but I'm going to have it my way in your life as well, and, and also all of us. That's the nature of sin, is selfishness. So God made Jesus, who knew no sin, he never sinned, never broke the law, lived that perfect life of love, made Jesus to be sin on our behalf. He became our sin and died on the cross, and with him all of our sin died, so that we might become the righteousness of God so that we might become the moral health of God. It comes to us as a gift, not of our own making, but of the making of Jesus on the cross. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This word is logos, and it's often the gospel. It's not the word gospel, but it's, it's that idea of the gospel of reconciliation. He then goes on, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and not counting their trespasses against them, and he's committed to us the word of rec reconciliation. Do you understand what a privilege and opportunity has been given to each one of us as Christians? He has put us as priests, standing before a sinful world that's been forgiven, but who hasn't received the gift of eternal life. He has put us as that priest in between to go to them with the message of Christ. It concludes, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. What did an ambassador do? They went to a foreign country to be a representative to that country for the king or for the president. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are sent to the world for whom Jesus died for all, and therefore all died as though God were making an appeal through us. I love this. As though God were making an appeal through us. It's not that he really is. He's using us as his voice and as his, as his feet and as his hands. But really, it's the Holy Spirit within us making the appeal. If I was dependent on myself to do this, there would be no headway, no ground gained as though God were making appeal through us, we beg, of, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Here's the ultimate conclusion of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 through 5. He's asking the Corinthians to return, but this is a much wider appeal to the whole world. We beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I think of verses from John, and I'm just going to read through these. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him should not, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Christ died for all, and therefore all have died. All have been forgiven. They just need to receive that gift by believing. John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. The moment you believe, you're given the gift of eternal life, according to this verse, so clearly in the grammar. He does not come into judgment, she does not come into judgment, but has already passed from death, from eternal death, into eternal life. Or again in John 6, 47, said so succinctly, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. 
How do you get reconciled to God? By believing. By believing. John 11, 25 through 27. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? And she gives him the correct answer. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. We see these same words again in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh, and that believing you may have life and is getting at eternal life in his name. So how do you get reconciled to God? By believing in Jesus, by believing that he's the Messiah, by believing that he is God, Yahweh, the Lord. There's a whole lot of other things to believe that we find throughout the documents of the New Covenant and those leading up to the documents of the New Covenant in the Gospels. And so we beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If you've entrusted your life to Christ, if you have believed in his name, if you have believed that he is the Messiah and the Christ, you have become a brand new creation. The old has passed away. No longer any need to live under that confining regulations of the Mosaic law because now we live under the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the law, who writes that love into our hearts, who pours out his love into our hearts. And now we rejoice as new creations, as new, brand new creatures. Sometimes I'm haunted by my past. Oftentimes on Saturday and Sunday mornings, the enemy reminds me of some horrendous thing I did in my past. Sometimes it takes me maybe an hour to recover because he hooks me in and I start dwelling on it. Sometimes I catch it really quickly. But I've been crucified with Christ. That old Grant is dead. You have been crucified with Christ. That old person is dead. And the, not, and the life we now live in the flesh, even as new creations, as new creatures, we don't look to ourselves. We live by faith, by belief in the Son of God who loved us and gave up himself up for us. We beg of you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God by believing in Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sticking with me. Really appreciate your taking the time out of your day to join with my wife and my mom and my daughter and I. Today is Mother's Day, so I prepared a, it's a Mother's Day tribute. This is a humorous one. I know that for many of you, Mother's Day is a, a painful holiday. For you, remember that the Holy Spirit, that God the Father, that Jesus loves you with an immeasurable love, this one God, and yet three persons, loves you with a boundless immeasurable, infinite love. We have a father that we can trust. We have a parent in the Holy Spirit whom we can trust. Our Mother's Day interlude. Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. No, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah, thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. 
Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. I hope you got a chuckle out of that. We don't need a mom personal assistant. I hope that your mom is here still with you. I've been blessed with two wonderful mothers one who is in heaven and one who is sitting here with me now. Let's pray. Father, just I thank you for our moms. Usually at this point in our service, we'd be handing out chocolates and carnations, but we are keeping the physical distancing, Lord. So I pray that you would give them a special Mother's Day gift today, that they would be so aware of your presence with them, your love for them, that you would encourage them. I know mothers so oftentimes think that they're failures. They bear the load and the concern for their children's well-being, for how they were raised. But Father, I pray that you would speak encouragement into their spirits, a word of grace into their spirits, that you have fashioned them in your own image, in the mystery of, of God and the Trinity. You've created us male and female. You've designed them to be nurturing and loving and kind and gracious. At the same time, I know that some of our mothers completely failed to do that, or even maybe abusive or neglectful or addicted. But Father, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you that we don't have to hold resentment that we can forgive. Thank you that we are brand new creations in Christ. I pray that you would give all of our mothers, our wives, a blessed day, a good day, a, a day of joy as we celebrate together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we have a closing song, Great Are You, Lord. Give it up.
Thanks again for joining me today. Happy Mother's Day. I hope you have a very enjoyable afternoon. I'm doing London broil this afternoon on a barbecue. So we're going to have a scrumptious meal ahead. We're going to be sitting out in the parking lot with our daughter later this afternoon. Hope you have a blessed a week, a good week. Our blessing today is found in Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We've been reconciled in Christ. Amen.